Floyd moves on in, and he scores! Hello, boys and girls, and welcome to the 30th episode of the Pod Street Bullies. Folks, I am Derek. And I am John. What's going on, everybody? And we're back after a longer than normal break, but regardless. Yeah, back, we're back. from the woods, man. Back yeah. from the woods. John here went off the grid for a bit, and I couldn't even reach him. I was worried. It's like, I'm going to have to do this by myself, and I'm not the entertaining part of this, so I'm glad he's back. Dude, <laughs> dude, I was getting a little worried I wasn't going to make it back. We, uh, uh, we go up to the Adirond- Adirondack Mountains every year. We go to this little town called Lake Luzerne, which is just outside of Lake George. I know you PA folk might not know what I'm talking about. Don't you but, slander uh, us, good old PA folks. <laughs> Do you know what I'm talking about? Have you ever heard I, of Lake George or anything like that? I've heard of um, the Adirondacks, like the Phantoms, okay. the Adirondack Phantoms, right? Well, yeah, so it's all, <laughs> I mean, it's all like woodlands up there. But Lake Luzerne is a smaller town, and that's why we stay there, because it's less money. Typically, we stay in a hotel, but this time we decided to go Airbnb. Oh, yeah. Do you ever do one of those? No, my wife has. She actually Airbnb'd to uh, – she stayed in Greece with like a bunch of her friends and loved it. Oh, well, we Airbnb'd a house, right? Mm-hmm. And like the house was really nice. I mean, except for that it was like a rundown cabin type look. But if you're into that, it was nice. But it, when it was run by some – artist lady and there were all these nice little paintings and things but in the description right it says two bedrooms and a screened in porch beautiful because we had one bedroom for reagan one big bedroom for myself my wife and my dog and then screened in porch in the adirondacks that's beautiful oh yeah one little problem Uh the screened in porch was the second bedroom oh there was an actual second bedroom, but it was storage. They had just, like, junk in it. And they didn't they tell had... you about that? No. Oy. Yeah. Because technically, they're not wrong. Technically, there are two bedrooms. Yeah. Well, technically. Shut up, Carl. And, like, you can't put a two-year-old on a screened-in porch when all you have is these huge trees and wildlife around you. I would have woke up in the morning and her blanket just would have been there because you would have been eaten by a bear or something. Oh, God forbid. So, <laughs> so uh, king size bed, all four of us slept in it. At least it was a king size and not like a twin or a. Ugh, Except I couldn't imagine. My, my daughter slept sideways. That uh, doesn't sound like fun at so, all. So every night I either had a head or a foot in my armpit. Well, depending on what you like, I guess it's not that bad. Like if you're Rex Ryan, right? Yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, t- toddler feet in my armpit have never been a real big thing of mine. Mm, but yeah. you know, teach their own. But yeah. I mean, no, it was it was nice to get away. The one other thing I'll say about it though is when you're in seclusion, man, your brain goes crazy. Every little thing that happened, I would just tie it to a horror movie. Like oh, yeah. there was a. There was a dog that was running loose that looked very similar to my dog. Yeah. And I, it came over and played with Shay, and I'm like, oh, my God. This Ooh. is like the ghost version of my dog. And, like, if I can grab the dog and look at its tag, it's going to say Shay on it. That would freak Which me clearly, out, too. <laughs> yeah. But then I'm thinking, like, you ever see that movie – was it the strangers where these people like Ooh. just terrorize? You know what I'm talking about? Exactly what you're talking about. So now I'm then I'm starting to think, you know what's going to happen? Somebody's going to show up at this house at two o'clock in the morning and be like, "Hey, man, have you seen my dog?" Like, no, I haven't seen your dog. Just all, just all chaos is going to ensue. <laughs> oh, so it didn't happen. I lived. I survived the Lake Luzerne horror nightmare well, Airbnb thank- thing. Thank God you're back because, like I said before, I can't do this on my own. Um, but, man, let's – I mean, I, I'm almost at a loss for words here. We actually have some news to talk about with the Flyers. Not just the Flyers, but the, the organization as a whole. Hockey's back, baby. Yeah, kinda. boy. Yeah, I mean, not really, but no, it's exciting. <laughs> yeah, the first little bit of news came out earlier today, which Monday being it, uh, Tyler Pitlick 
is out yep. for four weeks. Shocker. Yeah. It was uh, a wrist, right? Yeah, wrist injury, and it puts him out for the beginning of training camp. He presumably will be back for the beginning of the season. But maybe somebody puts a good impression and uh, on the coaches and takes his spot. What do you yeah, think? Yeah, but, I mean, I don't really know if he's out long enough. I mean, if if they're making him a part of this team, I don't really think he's going to be out long enough for, for them to be like, oh, somebody's going to take over. Like, we're talking some of training camp, right? Yeah. And then when he plays in the preseason, and if he's playing a little off, they're just like, well, he's recovering from an injury. Yeah. So... I think unless he re-injures it, we don't really have to worry too much. I mean, I don't really – I wouldn't be worried either way. I mean, we're talking about Tyler Pitlick here. But I don't think anybody's going to come in and just replace him because of the injury. No, yeah. I think he's – I think his roster spot is safe unless, you know, like you said, if something happens and he keeps re-injuring that. And, right. You know, who knows? We'll see. But the second bit of news we have comes from one of the prospects that we love talking about. Mr. Jay O'Brien is now the alternate captain for the Penticton V's of the BCHL. One of yep. the alternate captains. Yeah, yep, that was just announced a few hours ago. I mean, I think it's great for him. You know, he is in a, a league that I think is a little bit below him. He needs to rebuild confidence after a rough year, rough year with Providence last year. So, you know, this puts him in a leadership role in a league that he should dominate. Absolutely. You know, given his stature and given the fact that he was, what, the 18th overall pick in the 19th? draft? 19th. 19th. My 19th, apologies. 18th. I, I, one of them. Uh, Late one teens. Of them. You know, he should dominate this league, uh, especially after having, you know, a subpar season in college last year with Providence. But he subpar dominated. is putting it nicely. Yeah, I put it lightly there. But he dominated in high school. Like he, this should His skill set should translate. Right. You know, I think my biggest concern with O'Brien, this is complete speculation. I know nothing about his personal character. This is all just speculation. I just worry that he only does well in situations where he's comfortable or where he's already going to succeed. Like he doesn't like that climb, you know. Yeah, it's not necessarily a trait that I'd fall in love with. I'm not crazy about that. Right. I mean, because if he dominates in the BCHL and he's an alternate captain, he's going to feel great again. But then what happens if he goes back to college the next year and he struggles a little bit? Is it just going to be this constant, you know, back and forth and, oh, no, this isn't working. This isn't the right setting for me type thing. Yeah. He's got that's not the case. You're right. And he's going to struggle at, you know, the next level when he takes that next step, whether it's from the BCHL to college, whether it's from college to the AHL, whatever it may be, you're right. going to struggle. Every NHL player struggles at some point in their career, and it's just a matter of how he adapts to that next step. I mean, especially because he was drafted as almost a project. Oh, absolutely. You know, I mean, that's what happens with projects. You need to work at them. Yeah, and I think, you know, if he just stays the course, adapts well enough, you know, he'll be... I think he'll be a solid NHL contributor. Um, I couldn't tell you what level. I'm not a very good prognosticator, but you right. know, I think he'll. I, I'm hoping he will be able to take his skill set to the next level, translate it well enough that he'll be successful. Definitely. But anyway, congrats, O'Brien. It's great to take a leadership role. Down, kill it. Good to hear. Um, yep. With that being said, we get to what we all have been dying to talk about, especially me, because I've been ringing John's ear off talking about how excited I am with this. Folks, there is a problem, and the problem is that the Flyers haven't re-signed Travis Konechny or Ivan Provorov yet, and we're going to talk about it for the next Damn, man. I mean, it, <laughs> it's every it's every team's problem, though. I mean, not Travis Konechny and Ivan Provorov, but, I mean, is the only restricted free agent, like, big-name restricted free agent to sign Aho at this point? Aho's re-signed. Colin White just re-signed um, the other day. Right. Let's see here. I had some notes. Uh, they'll um, come to like, me later. Kasperi Kapanen. I yeah, mean, Kapanen, uh, Andreas Janssen as well with the yeah. Maple Leafs. But I said names. Big, I said big names, yeah. not just anybody. Big names, as in like Mitch Marner, Miko Rantan, uh, Brady right. Chuck. None of them have re-signed yet, and it's a right. stagnant market. 
with forwards and defensemen at this point, but first we want to touch on Travis Konechny. Yep. And news broke. This was, I believe, late last week. We had a tweet from Jason Mertidis, who's very close with the team, and he says that a deal apparently is very close with Konechny, citing that it's likely a bridge deal about two to three years, around four and a half million per year, which is good news. Yeah, I think that's great for the team and for Konechny. Absolutely. You know, it's it puts them in a spot where they're still saving money this year to spend on Provorov, who could end up likely being a pretty expensive contract. Uh, George, we'll get to that in a minute. Exactly. Um, but it also doesn't appear, which I, I'm encouraged by, it doesn't appear that Konechny's going to wait until the market settles with guys like Ranton, Marner, Kachuk, Point, Line A, Besser, even right. Kyle well, Connor. I mean, yeah, I mean, he's not on the level of any of those guys, though. Exactly. He's kind of that second tier, um, right? which bodes well for the Flyers because they're not going to have to shell out big bucks for him. Yeah, I mean, and Flyers fans need to recognize that. Like, we hold Travis Konechny in very high regard. And I think the NHL views him as a good player, but they certainly don't put him in that upper echelon. You're right. And it appears as though Philadelphia is going to help kind of set the market to a lesser extent, I should say. Um, Ottawa had their part with the Colin White deal. He signed for six years, $28.5 million, 4.75 per his stats okay. are better uh, than Travis Konechny, so I don't expect Konechny to sign for that, and it might bode well for the Flyers in that regard. But, hey, I don't want to, yeah. I don't want to call you wrong or anything like that. But his stats are better. Am I? Was I looking at the right Colin White? Colin White with Ottawa, yeah, yeah I believe okay. so. so. All right, so let me lay it on you here. Okay, so Travis Konechny, year one, twenty eight points in seventy games. Colin White in year one, two games played, no points. Do you really count that as a year though? If it was only two games, well, no. But I'm just saying they all have, they both have three bars on the uh, hockeyreference.com. Well, what's so this last season up, for him? That's what I want to know. Just shut up and listen for me to me for a second, will you? Oh, you're killing me. You get back from vacation, you're like Mr. Big Shot here. Just let's go. I'm always <laughs> Mr. Big Shot. Year two, connect me. Pretty much a full year, 81 points. I mean, 81 games and 47 points. Okay. Colin White, year two, 21 games, six points. Yes, I know it's still not a full season, whatever. Mm-hmm. This year, okay? Konechny plays the full season, 49 points. Colin White, 71 games played, 41 points. Okay. So I guess if you're doing like the point per game thingy, Mabobby, right? Mm hmm. He technically had a better year, maybe? Slightly, I guess you could say. Yeah, but, I mean, there's nothing about Colin White, at least on the stat sheet, and I don't really watch too much Ottawa games, because why? Yeah. Um, that There's nothing that says he's better than Konechny. And also, you got to take into account the fact that Ottawa has a lot of money to play with, and they probably weren't afraid Definitely. of shelling out an extra you know, 500 k to a million dollars for a guy who, really, who else do they have left? No, that's a great point. I mean, they have money to play with. Yeah, as whereas Philadelphia doesn't, and if Travis Konechny wants to be a part of the Flyers, which all signs have pointed towards that, he, right. I'm not saying it's going to be a hometown discount, but maybe a slightly less than what he could have gotten if he reached the open market. Yeah, and I mean, the thing is, too, is these bridge deals are in. Oh, yeah. Like, players realize now that if they take a bridge deal, they can possibly cash in twice. Instead of taking that, if you look at like John Tavares, who took a longer contract, his first contract, and got underpaid, and now he's only getting one big payday. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, teams like the Flyers or anybody else, they don't have to shell out eight years and then cringe when the bottom half of that contract comes along, you know, and they're like, oh, no, you're 32 and we have four more years to pay you. Oh, yeah. Like, I'm assuming the Kevin Hayes deal might turn out. Ah, oh, right. Exactly. <laughs> like many are assuming, you know, I've heard. Right. But um, right. when it comes to Connect Me Too, there were some comparable contracts being signed. We talked about Kapanen and Inny Onsen. Um, mm-hmm. Guys like Andre Burakovsky, Jakob Verana come to mind where you've got... Verana signing two years at 6.7, which is 3.35 per year. Burakovsky gets $3.25 million for this next year with Colorado. They're a little 
older, I believe. I think, what, Konechny's 22? Yes. Yeah, so Burakovsky's 24. Still, uh, you know, very comparable because they're each about a half a point per game, you could say. So that works in their favor because they're getting paid under $4 million, like uh, less than $3.5 million really. But one thing I thought was interesting is the Nikita Gusev deal. Mm. Uh, you know, obviously, def- definitely different circumstances, but 27 years old coming from the KHL. Um, very, very good stats when it comes to his uh, years in the KHL, but he's somewhat of an unknown commodity because we've seen KHL players come over and play really well. We've seen them come right. over and play like crap. But Yeah, it was like a height-based contract, to be honest with you. Exactly. You know, it's four and a half mil for two years. And four and a half million dollars per year for two years. What if Konechny sees that and says, I want that kind of money because he's like, I earned this and this guy did nothing to earn that contract. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the big sell point for Konechny is that it's only a three year contract. I mean, that puts him right in his prime when this is done. He can cash in big time. Right. You know, I mean, you're still making 4.5 a year. I compared to what he was making that's great so i think he's going to look at it as you know what i'm going to take this 4.5 over three years and as long as i continue to improve which i'm sure he's expecting and everyone else is expecting he could have a big old payday absolutely and i guess i wanted to get your opinion on this too do you think that let's play hypothetical here tomorrow mitch marner miko rant and one of the big name guys signs and it's yep. it's a deal that we all anticipated, you know, a big deal. Would that affect the contract negotiations between the Flyers and Travis Konechny and his agent? I don't think so. I think it's a completely different story. I mean, if if Konechny is putting himself anywhere near someone like Marner, he, I want to know his supplier. You know, <laughs> I really, <laughs> I, I love what Konechny brings to the table, but he's not Mitch Marner at this point. Um, yeah. And according to Martinez's tweet, too, he says it doesn't seem like that he's going to wait for that kind of market to settle, which is a good sign. Right. Um, and let's see here. I wanted to talk a little bit about Scott Lawton, too, because of his contract. Is that something Konechny might base his deal off of as well, saying, hey, well, I'm better. Should I, I should get more money than what he's making, which is 2.3 a year. Well, yeah, but he would be. I mean, I think that there's a substantial difference between 2.3 and 4.5. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, I think that um, I think that there's going to be enough of a difference there for Konechny to feel like the team. Um, why can't I think of the word? What, um, values him? Values him. There it is. There values him more. Yeah. It, it would make sense because, let's be honest, to this point in Scott Lawton's career, I, I'm not going to tag him with the disappointment uh, tag here, but for a first round pick, he hasn't produced like we would like him to. Right. Yeah, he's a fourth liner. Yeah, and nothing wrong with that. Every team needs no. him. Um, yeah. You know, I kind of have a question for you. Sure. So we're we're just throwing this number. I mean, compare. I mean, based off of a tweet, but say it's more than four point five. Say he wants five. Are you cool with that? There'd be conditions to it. All right, um, what would they be? If Provorov would sign a bridge deal, because you still need some type, not some type, but you would need some money left over in case someone goes down during the season, trades happen, right. things like that. Um, I wouldn't be to the point where I would gripe about it and say, no, five's ridiculous. You know, I'm going to stop rooting for the team. I'm going to go on this podcast and have a three hour rant and just yell and scream into this microphone. But Mm. I'm not going to be too upset, but it's, it's, it's a little more than I would like. (laughs) Right. You know, if he signs five, I would want him for longer term. Oh, oh, absolutely. You know, maybe a five by five. That way he can still get another contract. But yeah, if, if I have to give him five million, I would want a little bit more time with him. Like maybe similar to a Couturier contract and what he yeah. signed a couple years ago. Because mm. Hextall really, thank you, Ron. <laughs> yeah. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. <laughs> yep. 
Um, so if we're going to cap off, I guess, is there anything else you'd like to touch on before I ask the question that I wanted to ask you to end the segment here? No, I have nothing else. All right, so let's say it doesn't work out. Travis Konechny says, you know what? I don't want to play for any kind of money you're going to offer me or whatever money they had already offered him. And mm-hmm. he's like, I'm just going to wait this year out. What is the contingency plan that the Flyers would have to help ease that pain? Man, I, you know, I don't really think there's a pleasant contingency plan. I think you're going to have to bump somebody up to that top six, maybe like Limblom. So it's an internal fix. Yeah, I mean, I don't think you're going to be able to trade Konechny for um, equal value because teams are going to look at it as, you know what, he's not, he's, he's not playing for you guys, so you're going to just want to get something out of the deal. Like, I don't even think they'd get a great draft pick out of it. Now, what if you package him with, uh, you know, a first-round pick and try to get somebody that can contribute? Yeah, I just worry that it's too close to the beginning of the season for teams to go and make a big move like that. Agreed. You know, at this point, the dust kind of settled with all that stuff. I don't think any teams are looking to really shake things up. I think you're right. I think that if there is a contingency plan in place, which I'm sure there is, but all signs are pointing towards Konechny signing a deal here, it's going to come from within the organization. There's going to be a phantom. There's going to be somebody who just made the jump to the – pros that is going to right. take that spot and it probably bodes well for guys like frost faraby rubsov maybe even a guy like albe kubel if they decide to bump people up from the bottom six right yeah i mean i'll be honest with you dude i would be completely shocked if this guy isn't re-signed by the beginning of the of training camp oh me as well you know you, you hear a bunch of chatter that maybe gives a little bit of evidence towards the guy we're going to talk about next, but you haven't heard anything yeah. regarding connect me with this. I just, you know, I think that this is moving a lot slower than everybody expected throughout the NHL. And there's nothing abnormal considering the situation that it's taking this long. And I think he's going to, he's going to resign. Yeah. I, I ultimately do think he will as well. Um, and I can't really say the same for this next individual we're about to talk about shall we talk about him i i'm all spent with the connect me talk so let's do it all right ivan Provorov, folks still unsigned looking for according to brian hedger of the columbus dispatch 10 million dollars just no, kidding that, <laughs> he yeah, rescinded that, that t- <laughs> well, when i read that i was like so long buddy yeah 10 million hit the bricks pal <laughs> That was, I, you know, when you think about it, and in any kind of business negotiation, you always want to start high with your offer, and I get that, but good God, $10 million for a, a, a guy who's played, obviously, full three full seasons, which is great, but right. he had a contract year this year and just didn't play well. No, he but didn't. Now, how much can you attribute that to him or his surrounding cast as well though yeah i mean it's really tough to tell right i mean they didn't have a good year the defense kind of stunk so i'm sure some of it had to do with that but also if you just look back at his individual play it was an off year it was homeboy struggled it was a very rough time for Provrov, and it, it was a rough time for the entire team let's be honest but You know, seven goals, 19 assists, 26 points. And yeah, you know, it's just point production. We're talking defensemen here. But you also look at the fact that he only had 16 takeaways. And then he gave the puck up 92 times. And we talked about this when we were talking about defensemen. uh, This was probably two months ago. But 92 is a lot for for me, I guess, at least. But, man. And his Corsi 4 percentage stinks, too. Really? Uh, Yeah, I mean, I don't really know a whole lot. I know it has to do with possession, but if it's under 50%, it's not a good thing, and his was 47.5. Yeah, so not a ton below 50, but still not a good sign that it's below 50. Right. You know what the thing is with him, though? This is still just his third year. I mean, and we were just ready 
to crown this guy our number one defenseman and say he was going to be the greatest thing ever from that point on. Oh, yeah. You know, he's going to take some time. We just need Provorov and Provorov's camp to understand that he is not, you know, this bona fide number one defenseman. And that if we're going to allow, if we're going to be patient with him, then they also need to be like, all right, you know what? Let's come back down to reality and do a bridge deal. Yeah, it's, uh, I'll quote Bill Parcells here because being a Cowboys fan, I'm all too familiar with this guy, but they got the anointing oil out too early on this guy. Um, oh, for sure. Not to say Provorov can't turn into that franchise defenseman we've so longed for. But it's still very early. You know, guys like that, sometimes they take some time to develop. And if it takes some time, so be it. But Right. I mean, he's he's in a good place. It's just he's not fully there yet. And I think that he wants to be paid like he is. And I get it uh, because he's being treated as the number one defenseman. He His average time on ice over these past three years, three seasons, has been 23 and three quarter minutes. Which yeah. is like that for a kid that age, and for his first three years, that's pretty impressive, I guess, if you want to put it that way. Yeah, but also the same thing could be said that you mentioned earlier. It's also because of the cast of characters around him. You're right. You know, you're pairing him with Travis Sanheim, who may not be ready to take over a top pairing role with the team. And then you look at his backup, you know, the most consistent defenseman last year was Radko Gudis, and he's gone. Right. So he played not necessarily paired with guys, but like Brandon Manning and, you know, it it was ugly. It wasn't the greatest. (laughs) Right. Now, of defensemen that are kind of in his tier, has anybody else re-signed? No one has re-signed yet. We could look at guys like Anthony D'Angelo. We could look at guys like Neil Pionk and Jacob Truba, but Truba... He's got six pro seasons under his belt, and he just signed his third contract, including entry level. So that's not a great comparison. Pionk even is kind of – he's like Konechny. He's that second tier. Right. And even Carlo, he hasn't re-signed yet. D'Angelo, he he hasn't re-signed yet either. Those guys are the second tier, you know, the Travis Konechny's of the defensemen, I guess you could say. Yeah. (laughs) So, I mean, you're you're thinking Provorov – Wierenski and Charlie McAvoy. I mean, I know some people would say Charlie McAvoy is above, way above the two of those, but I disagree. I don't yeah. like that. I think uh, it's Wierenski is the best. I, I got right now, all things yeah. considered, I think Zach Wierenski is the top of this RFA class for defensemen. The stats say so. The yep. fact that you know he's got a great pairing with Seth Jones in Columbus, mm-hmm. and that helps immensely. Don't get me wrong. But that Wierenski's the guy. And I think that you look at right now, obviously, with those guys not being signed, the market's not set. So how, you know, you don't want to leave money on the table if you're Provorov and his agent. You want to wait for a deal to get by. But there's also, there's some talk. And I was scouring the web today for Columbus and Boston News. Okay. So the latest on Charlie McAvoy, uh, Fluto Shinzawa from The Athletic reported on Saturday that the Bruins and McAvoy may actually be looking at a bridge deal. And okay. uh, Don Sweeney, in an interview with Don Sweeney, he says, he's the GM for the Bruins, he goes, quote, Brandon and Charlie will be a part of our organization for a long time. We think really highly of them as players, on and off the ice. We just have to find a common ground. We're working to get there. Yep. Which, let's be honest, with the Bruins having only $7.2 million left to sign just Carlo and McAvoy... It's, oh wow, that's yeah. tight. There might be some moves made with Boston here, but a bridge Shit. deal if they want to keep everyone in place from their Stanley Cup run this past year or the yep. run to the finals at least might make sense to try to get them on bridge deals. Yeah, yeah. And again, they're in, so I don't see it. either of these guys being too against it. Exactly, and I'm glad you said that too because Warensky apparently, um, according to Brian Hedger, the same guy we were just you know, kidding around about. He said that um, Wierenski and Columbus are looking at a bridge deal, potentially three years in between five to six million dollars per. It would allow, which is good for Wierenski too, and the Blue Jackets really, it's a mutual um, good thing. 
Right. Um, Columbus could retain his I... rights when it expires, so he still remains an RFA, but Wierenski is arbitration eligible, which I think okay. the same thing would remain for Provorov if that happened. Yeah, I'm assuming. I don't know. But I actually had a – I was thinking about the bridge deal and Provorov, and I was wondering maybe he doesn't want it because he's afraid – that this year might – like what happened this past year might continue. Like this becomes and, the norm. Yeah, and then his mm-hmm. value drops significantly. I, so maybe he's hesitant because if he's going – if I go and put in a three-year bridge deal, yeah, I might I might turn things around and I might kill it. But at the same time, I might not. This might be the new Ivan Provorov. I mean, you got to remember, he's still 22. He's going to have these kind of thoughts in his head. I'm 30, and I still have these kind of thoughts in my head. So what if he then goes, nah, I need to be signed long term, and I need to be sitting pretty with money just in case this happens? That's great. I, you know, I, I applaud him for trying to milk this situation and get the most out of it. But – We've seen far too often players get paid on past performances yep. and not live up to it. Yep. And if the Flyers think that Provorov's trajectory is heading towards him being our franchise defenseman, I think he should get paid that way. I, I think he should. But it's early. He's young. We don't know. You know, like you said, he could end up being a flop, essentially. Right. Is this what? a risk they're willing to take? What are you comfortable giving him? That's so difficult for me to answer. Um, so, all right. I mean, the money's tough, but like, what kind of term? I would love to lock him up, honestly, because I do think that he's going to turn it around. He just needs that strong supporting cast like guys like McAvoy and Wierenski have in their respective teams. Um, yeah, the problem with me, Derek, is if I'm going to lock him up long term, I, I'm, I don't want to pay him more than... Seven? That's fair. I like that number. That's... Yeah, he probably doesn't. No, of course he doesn't. Because if he, he... wants to get $8 million a year, he's going to look at seven and be like, heh, good one. You yeah, know? And see, and then eight by eight to me is when I start to cringe a little bit. I, for some reason, you know, seven is just like a tier below that where I could be like, all right, if he turns out to just be like a second pairing guy, yeah, fine. This just... This whole situation to me, if we're going to include what's happening with McAvoy, Wierenski, I really just think that if these bridge deals happen with the other two, Konechny's got to sign one. But if he doesn't, it actually might bode well for the Flyers because he sees... Did oh, you mean Did you mean Provorov, buddy? Yeah, I meant Provorov. All right, you like, said Konechny. I'm so yeah, my apologies. Um, long day at work, but... That's all right, buddy. Anyways, <laughs> um, if Wierenski and McAvoy sign these bridge deals, it might bode well for the Flyers in the long run because then if Provorov still wants that long-term deal, you can say, listen, that's great, but look at what your compadres over here are making now. One's making five, one's making six, one's making four, whatever the number may be. Okay, you want eight eight years? I'm going to offer you six and a half. And if we could get him on an eight-year, six and a half million dollar deal, phenomenal. Don't think it's likely, but hey. Yeah, yeah. I just – I feel like he doesn't have as much of a leg to stand on as he's standing on. No, he had a bad contract year. That's my yeah. – I've heard other people discussing it and sticking to the contract year argument, which I agree with. I don't think that this year is remnant of what he is, but – right. The fact remains that it was a bad year. And guess what, bud? Your contract's up. Now we're going to pay you accordingly. Exactly. I mean, you have to pay based on what you've seen. And this most recent year, and we're only, we can only base it off of three of them, this most recent year did not bode well. Yeah, and it's you look at the situations with these other teams too. Philadelphia is kind of caught somewhere in between Columbus and Boston because Columbus is or not Columbus, Boston is strapped. They don't have yeah. a ton of money to play with, and they've got two guys to sign just on their blue line. I'm a, I think they're the only two left. Orensky, right. the only person left for Columbus, and Columbus has fifteen point seven million dollars. What if Yarmo Kekalainen goes? Screw everybody else. I'm just going to blow this market up to screw over Philadelphia and Boston <laughs> because they're Eastern Conference foes. Why right. not? 
Well, you know, the thing is, I mean, that sounds great if we're playing video games, but at the same time, like, the other reason that I think this is maybe Philadelphia is having a hard time is because you have to think ahead. Like, you always are going to have to pay more people. And further down the road, whether it be next year or the year after, there are other people that are going to need to be signed. I mean, we drafted a ton of great players. Well, eventually, they're going to need contracts. So Philadelphia needs to put themselves in a position where – they're strapped they're not strapped and they're able to make some moves and decide to let people go without having to take a big hit you know so if you give Provorov a bridge deal and you give Konechny a bridge deal then by the time it's time to pay them the big bucks you can kind of assess all right are they worth this considering what we have coming now or should we put that money somewhere else I kind of feel like bridge deals just pass the buck. It's like, you know, it, you and I, let's say, okay, you know, hey, you, your wife comes to you, my wife comes to me and says, listen, this needs fixed. You know, it doesn't need fixed right now, but it needs fixed in the near future. Okay, yeah, I'll do it tomorrow. She tomorrow ain't coming comes. to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, my wife would, and she would go, okay, fix it. i will be like, okay, yeah. I'll do it tomorrow. Okay, a little bit of leniency there. Next right. day comes. Okay, Derek, this really needs fixed, and you didn't do it yesterday. You said you'd do it today. Ah, babe, I'm swamped. I got stuff to do. I'll do it tomorrow. Just keep putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. Right. You're going to have to pay these guys if you want them to be a part of your franchise. So Yeah, but there's a there's a question mark with Provorov, and I don't want to sound too dramatic because I don't mean to, and I think that he's going to turn out to be a great player, but there's a question mark here, okay? We keep saying he had a rough year. You're not going to pay this guy like you would if he had a fantastic year. You can't. That would be foolish. But wasn't there a question mark also when they signed Couturier to the extension? Because to that point, he hadn't put up more than, what, 40, 50 points a year and was considered mainly a defensive defenseman or defensive center. Yeah, but we weren't able to talk about that on the podcast, so I didn't think about it like that. Oh, well, here I am so, expanding <clears throat> your mind. Well, I want you to expand my mind. I want to talk about Prover. I'm not connecting. Well, but, no, I'm not talking serious, connecting. I'm talking I mean, Couturier. Ah, uh, whatever. You know what I'm – but in all seriousness, though, <laughs> do you understand where I'm coming from here? I absolutely do, yeah. There's there's two main sides to this, and I think we're standing on each side. Right. I can at I'd least understand. Them, I'd love them to maybe meet somewhere in the middle. Like give give do five years. Yeah. Why not? Now, it, it, it comes into effect that – you know, does Provorov want to still be an RFA with arbitration rights at the end of the deal, or does he want to be locked up long term and not have to worry about it, but still get the money that he's owed for that big contract? You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. I mean, this is a sticky situation. This is not going to end as smoothly as the Konechny deal. No, absolutely not. I don't think it's going to end smoothly as as smoothly as the McAvoy or Wierenski situations either, because. According to the same guy, Hedger, he says that Wierenski, his agent Pat Brisson, and Yarmo Kikalainen, and the GM for the Blue Jackets, are all really hopeful that this deal gets done before training camp. Right. Um, as I, as his assistant GM Brent Flair saying, we hope these contracts get done. Like, well, yeah, you hope they get done, <laughs> but it's a matter of whether you're going to make the moves to make it happen. Right. So my question for you is: Let's say Wierenski doesn't do a bridge deal i'm just changing it because we're assuming provorov doesn't want a bridge deal okay so let's say warensky signs for eight years nine million per i'm completely making up the uh, price tag here okay do you think that provorov can go to chuck fletcher and say that he should be paid exactly what warensky's being paid he has an argument and i'll tell you why Okay. You want to talk about the stats and how Wierenski really dominates the statistical categories here, but there is one stat, and it's maybe not called a stat, but over the past three years, out of the 246 games in each in all three seasons combined, Wierenski has only played in 237, which he only missed nine. You know, right. not a big deal. Provorov's played every single game. Durability. It's an intangible. Yeah. It's not a, I guess you can't measure it really, but in three years, each year he played 82 games. 
that's that's something that him and his agent can say, hey, you want a guy that's in the lineup every night? I'm your right. guy. Pay me accordingly. Now, do you think that Chuck Fletcher then goes, all right, yeah, that's fine? Because I, I don't think he's quite Zach Wierenski, even though he's played more games. No, I agree. I think that Provorov has more of a leg to stand on than we initially discussed, but it's still not the strongest of legs. Right. Um, I think that if Wierenski, in a, in a in a perfectly just world, if Wierenski signs for nine, Provorov signs for eight and a half. Yeah. But we're not <sighs> living in a perfectly just world. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I do not want to pay him over eight million dollars. I don't want to pay him eight million dollars. No, I would love a bridge deal because you think three years from now. What? What? I no. I I do kind of. I don't know. It's, you just got finished saying you didn't. You. I was you making the case. Up. I was making the case for locking no, him. Up. No, 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 no. You stop said drinking. you. Wa- you should. Say, you said you wanted to lock him up. Well, yeah. I mean, but here's the thing. There's advantages to both. I like discussing the advantages, the disadvantages, and I like flipping my story because, you know, that's what I do. This is Derek backpedaling. I'm not backpedaling. <laughs> my opinions are formed, changed. I never backpedal. But the the bridge deal definitely makes sense. Only for the right... Uh, the bridge... Let me backtrack for once in my life (laughs) rewind the bridge deal would make sense from a financial standpoint because if you're trying to save money now that's the way you go because you're going to pay him less than if you were going to sign him to an eight-year deal because that eight-year deal is probably going to be somewhere in the realm of eight million dollars eight by eight yeah so you want to save money now you offer the bridge deal and you try to push that you say screw it and let's just lock them up long term Bite the bullet, Chuck, and you get it done. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I have a feeling that the Flyers want a bridge and Provorov wants the long-term deal, and that's the big stalemate here. Mm -hmm. It's going to take some kind of coercion from one side or the other, and the other one's going to have to not necessarily fold, but say, okay, I see it your way. Yeah. So when do you think this is going to happen? I think this gets done before training camp. I hope it does. Yeah? Yeah. I I really do. If if it oh, doesn't you're get a lot done, more optimistic than me. If, if it doesn't get done before training camp, it gets done shortly after it begins. Hmm. I don't think Provorov wants to miss too much time with the club because there's been some changes made. There's new players. He's gonna have a new partner, a new pairing partner in yep. Matt Niskanen. Assuming you know all of our projections are correct. You want to get to know the guy. You want to get to know his playing style. You want to get to know his getting to ins know and outs. You getting to know all about our, you. Our first oh. song, our first serenade from John <laughs> Gove of the night. Um, but yeah, you want to get to know the guy you're playing with. You know, it's like when I was when you and I started talking about the podcast. I was like, I just want to get to know you because if I don't like you, I'm just gonna be like, screw it, I'll do it myself. Right. Yeah. Well, <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> I don't think he's going to be playing this year. At all? At all. Really? So, I, I know. I know. It, I don't like to be this dramatic because it's very ESPN. But, um, sorry, ESPN. But Don't be sorry. <laughs> um, no. So, in a perfect world, right, he would sign before in training camp, like you said. I think that would be fantastic. I don't think that's, there's even a chance of that happening. And I think that once preseason starts, maybe, you know, your attention starts to go elsewhere, right? You're starting to focus with the product on the ice. And yes, you want to lock up Provorov, but not all your attention is there because you're focusing on what's actually happening on the ice. If we go to game one of the regular season and Ivan Provorov is not signed to a contract, I don't think he's playing the whole year. Because I think then the Flyers are going to look at what happened with Nylander – what did yeah. he sign it November? Or he signed at the deadline, December first, right? And he didn't have a great year. Mm-hmm. So I think instead of throwing the money at the guy and then him not playing well, they're just going to go, "Hey, you know what? I'm not giving you all the cards at this table. If you decide you don't want to play for this amount of money, then you can just sit down and not play." Now the Flyers will pay dearly for that 
because that really changes things on the blue line. But I really think that not only Provorov, but other players, if it starts to go into the season, they might be missing the whole year. It's not out of the realm of possibility. I really I, hope that doesn't happen. But. Of course, yeah. I, nobody wishes that. Um, as much the Flyers, if that were the case, the Flyers need to do the best job that they can in convincing Provorov that they don't need him. It's well, a, to, we're gonna. I want to jump down a rabbit hole with you for a second. Let's do it. So now we're just I mean, we've got time to talk. So let's just talk. So what if he doesn't sign? Do you trade him? Try to trade him? Is somebody gonna want him? Is somebody gonna want a guy that just held out? And yeah, no, it, it's tough. You know, it, some team is the, gonna take a flyer on him. I'm sure, but. Right, but are, what are you you're probably get? not going to get much of a return. You probably won't even get a first-round pick for him. Exactly. That's my case, and I don't think that it would be smart to trade him. Right. Um, God, does this remind you a little bit of Lindros, like minus the whole training staff and all that crap? <laughs> well, I mean, Lindros is a little bit more of a prima donna. I think what we're all painting Provorov as a prima donna, but we really don't know what's going on behind the scenes. Like Eric Lindros was a prima donna. I almost want to blame Provorov's agent for this because typically it's the agents that, you know, book these demands and want this and want that. But how much of that blame does fall on Provorov's shoulders? Yeah, that's tough too, right? I mean, it is essentially the agent and it's the agent telling him, Hey man, this is what you're worth. If you yeah. accept anything less than this, you're a fool. Yeah. You it's know, like, and again, he's 22 and he's impressionable. Oh, you yeah. Know? So maybe it's not really Provorov, but if the agent is steering the ship, it still doesn't bode well for Philadelphia. It's like when I was, I think, uh, I think it was like 13, and my mom's like, yeah, you're the best baseball player on the team. And turns out I wasn't, but, you know, <laughs> she made me feel like it at least. And then I was like, listen, coach, I want to pitch. And they're like, you're going to stick out in right field, and you're going to uh, like it. Good old right field. Yeah. I only got hit two when there were lefties at the plate, and there weren't that many where I live. <laughs> <laughs> but overall, Provorov, when you think of this, is the guy on the blue line in Philadelphia. McAvoy, Wierenski, they can be, but they're also surrounded by better right. players than Provorov is. Provorov wants to be paid like the guy. Averages more ice time, hasn't missed a game in three seasons, could use that as leverage. I just, how, I guess on a scale of one to 10, John, how concerned are you? With him? With Provorov re signing with the Flyers. Before the season starts? I guess just overall, like if you can put it all into the cauldron and mix it up, just so give me a number. If, if 10 is the most concerned, is that how we're playing this game? Yeah. I'm, I'll go eight. Okay. I don't want to be too dramatic, but I'm pretty pretty concerned. Yeah. I'd, I'd go six. I That's the optimist in me, but still very concerned because as much as Fletcher may not show his hand, the Flyers kind of need him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they do. You're well, going to because... lean on Niskanen as their number one defenseman whose stats have been declining steadily over the past how many years? You're going to lean on Sandheim, who may not be up to the task. Braun, Gostisbehere, we've seen. Uh, just... well, I mean, the thing is, too, I think that Fletcher's plan was to bring in these veterans to complement the younger players. If Provorov is gone, right, that completely blows up plan out of the water because now you have to rely even more heavily on these veterans and they're not ready to be relied on heavily at this point but then you shift your focus to maybe a guy like Sandheim who could develop into a number one defenseman do you think well yeah but if you're looking at this year right yeah. you're you're in a tough spot yeah no, I, I agree and I guess if we're going to cap this thing off put a bow on it send it off we're going to get to the Twitter question that we posed to all of our fans, all of our friends on Twitter here. Yep. We wanted predictions. We wanted people to share with us what their ideal contracts would look like for Provorov and Konechny. So the first response that we got, which doesn't surprise me one bit, came from Nick Hunsicker, 
who said two years, two and a half million dollars for TK. <laughs> I'm assuming annually because there's no way in hell we'd ever pay Konechny one point two five million dollars right. per year, and right. six by six for Provorov. Well, Nick, I, I think I, I can be sarcastic with you now, Nick. You are living in a fantasy land, my friend, if you think that these contracts are going to happen. Yeah, we love your support, but damn, yeah. buddy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the TK one, absolutely not. The yeah. Provorov one, I would love, oh, yeah. but I don't think he wants that. No, absolutely. I agree. The second prediction that we have comes from Calder Hart. And Calder Hart says, thinking TK will get a bridge deal. Two years, somewhere around $4 million. Seems reasonable. I like that. Yeah, I think it'll go a little higher, but yeah, it's reasonable for sure. Yeah, nothing for Provorov there, so we move on. We've got yep. Jay Powell, who goes three years, $4 million for Konechny. Nothing for Provorov, who holds out, plays in the KHL, and eventually has his rights traded to a Metro team because <laughs> Flyers. Accurate. Well, yeah, I mean, he, he lost me towards the end there. But, uh, I mean, again, the TK one, I think it'll be a little higher. But Provorov, the holding out thing, I would not be shocked. Yeah, and I mean, imagine if he goes to the KHL. <laughs> yeah, really. Don't think that's going to happen, but weirder things have happened. Right. The next one here comes from Craig Bowen. Craig Bowen goes, I tried. That's a good damn question, guys. Which... We know, obviously. Um, Chucky overpays, though. Says TK gets a bridge deal, two or three years at four to four and a half million. Provorov gets six to seven mere, seven years, seven to seven and a half million dollars. I like those numbers. I think those are yeah. very realistic. I don't think that that's overpaying, especially for TK. Yeah. Um, I mean, Provorov. The argument could be made that it's overpaying but considering how this situation is going i think we'd be all right with that deal yeah that deal definitely sounds better than a lot of the numbers we've seen <laughs> floating yep. around the twitter verse here uh the next one comes from our numbers guy connor bolgard <laughs> and he says eight years 7.25 million dollars per for provorov two years for Konechny at four and a quarter million dollars Another pretty realistic one. Yep. Yeah. I, I think they're fine. Yeah. So, Connor, you're going to have to get back to us on what the uh, implications on the cap is and how many <laughs> dollars we have left to spend after those deals. But we'll touch right. on that in the next episode. Anyways, we've got Nat Marlowe. He goes, prediction, top is TK, bottom is Proby. Anybody know Winslow from Cat Dog? Yeah. The top oh. picture is him walking into the house from his little mouse hole. The um, bottom one is him walking back into that wall. Yeah, leaving. Yeah, so TK's here. Provy's gone. Don't like that. No. No, I mean, I think that, you know, we talk about Provorov being gone. I mean, I think that's a really extreme situation. Yeah, I think that's, uh, you talk polar opposites. That's the one polar opposite. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Then we move on to the next one from Shane Moon. He goes, moment bridge deal. I'm assuming he meant Konechny. Autocorrect can be a real son of a gun. <laughs> I know from experience. Um, yep. Bridge deal, three years, four and a quarter. Provorov gets his eight by eight. That's yeah. another accurate. I, I think that's a, a good one here. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and then we actually got a question back from our question from Sean Kirkpatrick, and he goes, does it favor the Flyers to lock up Provorov at 8 by 10 based on the inflation we will see in contracts over those eight years? Last year was a down year, but we have seen the potential that he has, he adds there. It no. It doesn't make sense. To me. I mean, you can elaborate, but that's all I have to say about that. No. No, I won't elaborate because I don't think it makes sense. I I get the um, talking point there with the inflation. I understand that's a thing. I obviously, you know, if right. you don't understand that's a thing, you're stupid. But um, 8 by 10 just seems pretty steep considering, yeah. one, the contract year that he just had, and two, $10 million is still a lot. That's Dowdy money, Dowdy and Carlson. And, and we still remember, we still have to pay people. Yep. You know, maybe not this year, but other people are going to be looking to get paid. 
it's a young team. We have a lot of guys coming up with RFAs that are going to be due big raises. Yep. Yeah. So, excuse me. I don't know if you heard that one or not. That was unprofessional. Would, would you burp? I did burp. Yeah. Gross. I've been holding it in. Cut me a no. break here. Ugh. Yeah. Give me a Kit Kat. Give me a break. Um, the next <laughs> one. God, I'm leaving. Yeah, we're See done you. here. Bye. Signing off. <laughs> Sweet. I'll cover the rest of these. Anyways, <laughs> Austin Provenzano says, I think Provorov comes away with a seven by a seven and a quarter. Connect me really depends on the length of the bridge deal, but somewhere along the lines of two to three years to three and a half to four and a half million dollars. John, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, reasonable for both of them. I mean, I like seven, 7.25, I guess. And you like the three and a half or four and a half for Connect me? Yeah. Nice. All right. Now. We get to Nat Marlowe. You doing all right over there? I'm good. I, I'm taking too many breaks. Um, sipping on my drink here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now we got a couple <laughs> here. It, Nat replied to us again. He goes crazy prediction, but the but with Philly anything can happen. Fletcher doesn't even bother trying to sign Konechny and makes a bunch of crazy trades for picks to free up cap space to sign Provorov and pay him stupid Dowdy and EK money. EK being Eric Carlson. Yeah. No. No. Again. <laughs> Next one comes from our beloved listener, Lucas. Lucas yep. Rettle. I, I, Rettle. I hope that's right. Lucas, shout at me later if it's not. Connect me. He says three years, four to four and a half million dollars per. And Provorov, five years, seven million dollars per. If they ever reach a deal, it's crazy. We haven't heard of it yet. And it's the end of August. He seems a bit concerned. I'm all about five by seven. I like it. It's not going to happen, but I would love it. Oh, I'd jump for joy. Yeah. yeah. Run through the streets. Lucas, make it happen. Yeah, contact the contact his uh, agent and tell him, listen, pal. Listen right. We know me. you have good connections with him. Look at me. I am the agent now. <laughs> um, poorly, poorly played. Um, yeah. Do you think we could get Provorov's agent on here and just convince him? Does he speak English? I don't know. I don't mean that as like being disrespectful, but I know obviously Provorov being Russian, uh, he's got to speak this is English. True. Well, we could get a translator. Yeah, we'll figure something out. You know, I, I know some I people. Mean, yeah, I mean, maybe we can give him like ten minutes of airtime for the next like five or six episodes if he brings down the price a little bit. So, public service announcement, Mister Ivan Provorov's agent, if you're listening. <laughs> We would love to have you on to discuss we, what's going on here. We're just here. assuming it's – we're assuming it's a mister? Uh, Mrs. Uh, Mr. Person. or Mrs. Attention person <laughs> that represents Ivan Provorov. We would love to have you on to talk about this situation. You can disclose whatever you'd like with us, exclusives, whatever it may be. We'll uh, we'll run with it. We'll have some fun. Right. I mean I weave baskets underwater with Elaine Vino, so we can maybe get him to talk to you. He's also a pathological liar, so – you know, <laughs> regardless, we have one more contract uh, prediction here. He goes, Zach Zinn says two years, four and a half per year for Travis Konechny, and then eight by eight for Provorov. And he goes, what I want, TK, is fine. That was that was his predictions. But he, what he yep. wants is Provorov for five years at six and a half million dollars. And he also wants the same as his prediction for Connect me, which was two years, four and a half per. I would love his want for uh, Provera, but So would I. Good yeah. God, I would. No way <laughs> is that happening. Yeah, it's a shame, but... Yeah. Things so, will unfold. We'll find out. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah, so we move on to... What the f***? Our Wait What segment. Oh, yeah. I love this one. <laughs> I'm excited for this one, too, because this is... We got some good stuff to talk about here. Yeah. Yeah, we do. Do you, do you want to go first or you want me to go first? It's up to you. I mean, mine's more hockey-related. Should we do the hockey one first? Yeah, we'll go off on a tangent later. Not too long of a tangent, uh, but we'll go off. Oh, well, we always do. Of course. So mine is this proposed Twitter trade that I saw. Somebody else retweeted it or whatever. I don't even remember who actually put it on there. But this person suggests the Flyers trading – for Patrick Laine from Winnipeg because they're having their own contract problems. 
Spicy. In exchange, he wants to send Voracek. Philly would retain 10% of his salary. Morgan Frost, a 2020 first round pick, and Wade Allison. <whistles> what? <laughs> I mean, listen, I like Patrick Line. The dude is an awesome goal scorer, but he has not been amazing his whole career so far now there's a lot of time for that to change but there's question marks around him oh yeah this is like a this is like a bona fide stud trade this is interesting um i even went to the extent of researching your wait what segment here today because i had a pretty strong opinion on it (laughs) um (laughs) well before you go and throw numbers and make me look like an idiot uh, can I can I just say something else about this? Of course. You're now Voracek, okay, whatever. But you have Morgan Frost, who is gonna be a star. You have your 2020 first round pick who could wind up being a star, and you have a prospect who could turn into something really good. And wait out. Yeah, if we sign him to his entry level contract, that is. Yeah. This is just no. Not to mention for a guy like Line who has Honestly, like I've been seeing at least and reading a lot of deficiencies in his game. You yeah. know, as as great of a goal scorer as he is, you know, he was kind of donned the next Ovi, which right. is a very very lofty comparison. You still would like a more complete player, um, right? And he hasn't been. Yeah, and you know, it's been public knowledge that he's kind of fallen out of favor with the leadership in Winnipeg, and you know, whatever you may have here, but. Even like if we're looking at this trade, even with ten percent retained salary, Voracek brings around a seven and a half million dollar cap hit to Winnipeg. Which yep. right now Winnipeg let me see here, they have sixteen million dollars remaining, but they only have forty skaters and they still have to re sign Kyle Connor. Right. So seven and a half right there puts you at Eight and a half million dollars remaining to sign Kyle Connor, who's assumedly going to get probably around six, maybe. Yeah, not a good position for them to be in. No, I mean you're essentially taking the money you would give Line and giving it to Voracek. Yeah, and I forgot that they just signed Gabe, Gabriel Bork to a seven hundred thousand dollar a year contract, so that's not a huge blip on the radar, but still seven hundred thousand dollars less that you have to spend. You know? Oh, Derek. I look, I went overboard with the research on this. Sometimes, man. It's fun, though. You know, I, this is the stuff that I enjoy, and I'm in the right I profession. Uh, but <laughs> so, what's yeah. yours, man? Mine is today. It, it popped up at work today, and um, it happened over oh, the weekend. I thought yours was today, just in general, just the day itself. Yeah, that could be one, too, but we'll divulge <laughs> that later. But so I'm at work today. We're hanging yep. out. It's right after my lunch break. This guy walks in. Um, who will remain unnamed, but he's talking to a coworker of mine who works in the same department as I work in, and they start talking about sports, which normal water cooler talk, you know, I, I love mm-hmm. it. Starts talking about the whole Andrew Luck situation. As many of you know, Andrew Luck retired and yep. was very, I should say, distraught. You know, young guy, right. big career ahead of him, one of the best quarterbacks in the game right now. Marred by injuries, you hate to see it. I, you know, me pers- me personally, good for him to be able to walk away from the sport that he loves. Definitely, um, this man <laughs> just went off and was almost a Doug Gottlieb rant. You know, you saw the tweet from Doug Gottlieb. You know, such a millennial thing to do. Like, right? Man, He's an idiot, dickwad. Um, <laughs> sorry, but. He just like, where what a what a what a pussy da 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 like bet you know, I I've got family members who work in the steel mills of Pittsburgh and I'm like, that's where you lost me, pal. Like you <laughs> you, you grew up in Pittsburgh? Like, okay, cool. But you know what? Your quarterback isn't necessarily a model citizen either. Right. Yeah, so really. let's not go down that rabbit hole. And if you're gonna talk about him being such a wuss Let's also understand the fact that in this day and age, mental health is a very touchy subject. Maybe right. not, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say that there were mental health problems. But 
the fact that a young man like Andrew Luck made the decision that he values his wife and future kids, career after sports, over making millions and millions of dollars, not just on the field, but off the field in endorsements as well, and just said, you know what, I don't want to deal with the risk that is involved with playing this game. The guy's got a degree from Stanford in architecture. Right, right. I mean, he's going to be fine. He's going to be fine. (laughs) <laughs> Him and his wife, if he decides to have kids, they're going to be okay. Don't sit there and berate a guy because he made a decision to better his life and the value of life right. because you're, an, you're a disgruntled fan. He's not even This guy's not even a Colts fan, obviously, as yeah. I stated before. But, okay, I, you know, I don't pay this many dollars per ticket. And I'm like, I, I hope you don't pay that many because you just throw out a ridiculous number. like that. No one right. pays that kind of money for a football ticket. But it's besides the point, you sound like a jerk. And this is the whole, like, people want to talk about, like, the hockey man mentality. This is just the, the douchebag mentality, you know? Play the game. You get paid to play a game for a living. Like, yeah, because he's really effing good at it. Right. <laughs> really but he's good. also a human being and you know what? He sees all these other athletes dying young because of the injuries that they've sustained over the years. I don't blame him. I don't blame Andrew Luck one bit. I actually applaud that man and thank right. God he took the stance that he did saying I value my life after this sport more than I would value it playing it for the next however many years. Good right. for him. Seriously. Yeah. You know, I mean, the one thing that stunk about this situation had nothing to do with Andrew Luck. It's unfortunate that this came out, like, during a game. Yeah. You know, I mean, that really stinks. You know, whoever leaked it, you suck. I mean, and even the reporters, too. I wish that, you know, sometimes people in media had a little bit more of a heart and didn't really care if they were the first people to break a story. Did you see Troy Aikman lean in on Doug Gottlieb, though? Oh, uh, no. Oh, dude. A- and Aikman notably retired earlier than expected because of concussion issues. Right. And he just let loose on Gottlieb and then basically was like, I guess this is what Fox Sports 1 anchors do because right. obviously Aikman's a Fox guy. I'm like, mm. I-, I tried to put the Cowboys fan aside for a second, but I'm like, damn, Aikman, good for you, pal. <laughs> right. But yeah, yeah, mental health is not something that I like to joke about. It's not right. something anybody should like to joke about. This guy was smart enough to make a conscious decision saying, I don't value my quality of life as a football player more than I value it as a human being later on down the road. He wants yep. to be able to walk around and play with his kids. Yep. I, you, do what you, you do whatever the hell you want to do, Andrew Luck. Good for you, pal. Yep. All right. And that's my rant. All right. Well, it's always good to end a hockey podcast with a little bit of football. Yeah, right. You know, we talked about it, what, last week, I believe, too, right? Did we? <laughs> I think so. And then we got diverted, and I was like, this is a hockey podcast. Screw that. Uh, but <laughs> regardless, folks, this has been Pod Street Bullies episode 3030. We made it this far. Yes, we did. People, so now I'd like to break the news that this is our last episode. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'll I'll drive to New York just to punch you right in the face. <laughs> I'll punch you in the head. No, you won't. I uh, bet. I'll BS. That's a bet. Anyway. Anyways, folks, you know where to find us. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play. You can find us on really anything. Google search YouTube, us. YouTube. Yeah, YouTube if YouTube. Derek remembers to upload it. I'll remember now that John mentioned it, or else I wouldn't have. Um, but yeah, Spreaker, iHeartRadio as well. Rate us. Please tell us how much you love us. Also, hit that subscribe button, because what other hockey podcast centered around the Flyers is this entertaining? Let's be honest. None of them. Exactly. None of them. Correct <laughs> answer. But as for this episode, it's over. I'm going downstairs to hang out and watch more 13 Reasons Why with my wife. What? Yeah, we do that. Okay. Well, anyway, I'm not going to get into that now because we're saying goodbye. Now, she, you know what? She's watching The Bachelor anyway, so I'm just going to go over and play with my phone or something. I don't know yet. See, he's backtracking again, folks. You know what? We should go now. We're going to go. Have a great weekend, folks. Week, <laughs> folks. And as always, let's go Flyers. Bye now. <laughs>